What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so by my estimation, we have about two weeks before Thor Ragnarok comes out, which I firmly believe is going to be one of the most anticipated movies of the Marvel Cinematic Universe outside of Infinity War and Black Panther, just because we've yet to see a Black Panther film yet. So, you know, having that come out in February is going to be pretty stellar. But, you know, for me, I think Thor Ragnarok, if I'm going to be honest with you guys, I think that Odin's going to die. I think Thor is going to inherit the, the Odin force. And I think Marvel's going to use that as a way to basically explain why it is that Thor is able to uh, last as long as he is against Thanos in Infinity War. So what I want to do for the next couple weeks is I want to run over uh, the characters, some of the more prominent characters that are going to appear in uh, in Thor Ragnarok, a lot of the characters that we haven't seen. And so in this video, we are going to focus on the character of Surtur. Now, for those of you guys who saw my origin story video on Surtur, bear with me because some of that stuff might seem pretty familiar to you. So I do not consider myself to be an expert in real world Norse mythology, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, Surtur as he exists in Marvel Comics is a little bit different than the way that he exists in uh, in Norse mythology. In Norse mythology of the real world, Surtur is basically a Jotun. And as I understand it, what that means is he's not really a man, but he's not really a god. And he effectively is part of the coming of Ragnarok, which means that when the, the process of the destruction of Asgard begins to take place, he'll be one of the forerunners that leads to the Ragnarok event happening. But the way in which it works, again, you know, as far as I understand, the way in which it works in real world Norse mythology is is that Surtur will not actually be the one to kill Odin. Instead, Surtur would be the one to battle someone named Freyr. Now in Norse mythology, again, as I understand it, you basically have two types of gods. You have what are called the Aesir gods, I think is how it's pronounced, and then you have the Vanir gods, which are basically just two separate sects of gods within the Norse mythological pantheon. The Aesir gods are the most popular ones. Uh, they are, you know, Odin, Thor, Hela, Loki. The Vanir gods are like Freyr, which is Freya's twin brother, the god of Utility. You've got like uh, Nana, I think it is, or Nana, I'm not really sure exactly how you pronounce that, but it's essentially kind of split into to two different parts. In Marvel Comics, they don't take that approach. In terms of the Marvel Comics publications, Surtur didn't actually make his appearance until Journey into Mystery, issue number 97. With Surtur making his appearance alongside others, the Tales of Asgard line was designed to provide this sort of chronology, which is to say how it was Odin rose to power, what Odin was doing while he was in power. A lot of that stuff predated the arrival of Thor, and so it focused almost exclusively on the early days of Asgard itself, from the time that it was first created up until the time that Odin took power in the following days. When it came to Surtur, while his first appearance in issue number 97 of Journey into Mystery was a cameo feature, because Tales of Asgard was a backup feature, he had basically shown up in his full form and received his full origin in issue number 99. And again, what the whole basis of that story basically told us was that Surtur is essentially a fire demon, meaning he's one of the oldest beings in existence and actually predates Odin by quite some time. And because Odin was the leader of Asgard, and while real world Norse mythology had Surtur fighting against Freyr in Ragnarok, what Jack Kirby and Stanley had to do was effectively rectify and really just kind of consolidate those two concepts together in a way that made sense. And so what they ended up doing was they basically crafted this backstory where they established that somewhere along the line, Odin and his brothers Vili and V had faced off against Surtur in defiance. And as a result of that, Surtur harbored this sort of animosity towards Odin that lasted it for quite some time. Now, where Vili and V died during the conflict with Odin, and this ultimately resulted in him creating the Odin Force when he absorbed their life energies, fast-tracking to the second encounter between Odin and Surtur, when the two of them battled, Odin confined Surtur to the core of the Earth. And so, not only had he previously been defied by Odin, in their second encounter, he'd been defeated and then locked away and imprisoned in the Earth itself. And so, what this ended up doing was allowing Stan Lee and Jack Kirby to effectively go forward and establish Surtur as this arch nemesis of Odin himself in the Marvel Norse mythological pantheon. Now, what this does is this moves directly into the events of Journey into Mystery issue number 104, again, written by Stanley and Jack Kirby, which is the first time in Marvel Comics that the concept of Ragnarok is established. And what this does is it basically says that there will come a time whereby Loki will essentially free Surtur. And when that happens, that will set in motion the different stages 
that will result in the coming of Ragnarok itself. Now, as an aside here, on the whole, when it came to their method of storytelling, Stanley and Jack Kirby were relatively consistent with continuity. And because Jack Kirby was such a huge fan of Norse mythology, he would constantly chime in with Stan Lee and say, actually, that's not the way that it's supposed to go. And so the idea of Ragnarok, as it was originally presented by Kirby himself to Stan Lee in terms of how the story was written and carried on and so on and so forth, the idea was that the prophecy would basically say that there would just be this massive winner that would spread all throughout Asgard. And then Heimdall would basically sound the trumpet indicating the invasion of Loki. Loki and Thor would battle one another, and then their battle would be interrupted by the Midgard serpent, effectively this giant dragon that would rise from the earth. And then Thor would defeat the dragon, but then Asgard itself would be totally obliterated. Following that, the concept of Surtur being the being who sits at the very end of all things, waiting for Ragnarok to happen and for his opportunity to attack Asgard, would take that opportunity, show up, and then just totally incinerate whatever was left of Asgard itself. And that would be the process of Ragnarok. Now, there's no indication in the original stories written by Stanley and Jack Kirby that Surtur would basically be the person who would kill Odin. Instead, it basically just meant that Asgard would just be totally incinerated and all the gods would die. And this was important because what this did is it allowed Stanley and Jack Kirby to go forward into the Thor pantheon, always teasing the concept that Ragnarok was just over the horizon. Is the next story arc the story arc where Thor dies? And so it would be a really cool concept in terms of how it unfolded, and it allowed things to progress pretty steadily in terms of the Thor landscape. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that because Journey into Mystery was originally an anthology series that largely featured Thor, because he was the standout star, eventually Journey into Mystery effectively went away and was replaced by the Thor line of comics. And that's the reason why you can go through the Thor numbering and you have Journey into Mystery issue number 125 and then Thor issue number 126. It's a continuation of the numbering, but the title's name changes. Now, because Surtur would be the force by which Ragnarok would effectively occur, or at the very least, he was one of the most notable enemies of Odin and, uh, and Thor. Between May of 1966 and really October of 1975, Surtur only appeared a handful of times in that he appeared in issues 176, 177, 200, and 240. And for the most part, the concept of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby continued on in the way that it always had, in the sense that Surtur would be an indication of the coming of Ragnarok, that Surtur was a major force against Odin and Thor. And he would basically just escape his imprisonment, he would face off against the Asgardians, he would be defeated, and he would be imprisoned again. But because of the fact that Thor was continuing to rise in popularity, and some of Marvel's most popular titles at the time included Doctor Strange, The Avengers, things like that, we would end up seeing the Thor stories involve a lot of these characters. The other half is that because this concept was popular, Marvel would also use it for the purpose of bolstering characters who were not that popular at the time, but throw them into the story so that they would gain traction, or at least Marvel hoped they would gain traction among readers, which was the case with the character of Black Knight. But in June of 1977, running all the way up between Thor issues 260 to 271, writer Lynn Wine had taken over the title. And while Lynn Wine was not the most iconic writer of the Thor mythos, the person who was drawing for the Thor title at the time certainly was, and that was Walt Simonson. Now, Walt Simonson drew, you know, issues 260 to 271 in addition to uh, Thor annual number seven, but with issue number 337, he officially took over the title. Writing Thor for about four years, between November of 1983 to, I think it was June of 1987, Walt Simonson was for the Thor mythos what Chris Claremont was for the X-Men, in the sense that Chris Claremont came along, he began writing the X-Men, and basically transformed it into more of a soap opera based comic that focused largely on character development as opposed to just, you know, petty squabbles and conflicts. Walt Simonson, while writing and drawing Thor, expanded the mythos by leaps and bounds in quite a few ways. For example, one of the things that he did with issue number 337, really his inaugural issue and taking the title over, was to introduce someone named Beta Ray Bill, the first person to ever lift the hammer of Thor. This was the kind of mythos that Walt Simonson had added to the, you know, entire line of Thor. But for Surtur himself, Walt Simonson actually took what it was that Jack Kirby and Stan Lee had done and bolstered it in a way that hadn't really been seen before. And the reason why I say that is because between issues number 337 and 353, Walt Simonson began writing a story which is largely referred to as the Surtur Saga. And what this does is it basically took the concept of Ragnarok as it had been established by Lee and Kirby and said, it's finally happening. It's finally taking place. Now, this story was told in a couple different ways, really in stages. The first was the idea that Surtur was building something called the Twilight Blade, that if it was lit a flame using the Eternal Flame, that it would basically make him unstoppable and it would allow him to storm, uh, really, the entirety of Asgard, destroy Asgard 
Earth proper, and then turn his sights to the universe and obliterate all things in existence. Now, the Eternal Flame itself was basically this flame that was guarded by uh, by Surtur himself and was stolen by uh, Odin and Vili and V, which led to their encounter with Surtur in the first place. In terms of the Surtur saga, what this did is it basically began the process of setting in motion the stages of Ragnarok in the sense that one of the first people recruited by Surtur was Malekith the Accursed, basically one of the Dark Elves who was hell-bent on just doing bad things because that's what he does. But it was essentially this coming together of all these enemies of Asgard proper. Now, Malekith was tasked with capturing something called the Casket of Ancient Winners. And the Casket of Ancient Winners is essentially this artifact that contains the infinite cold of Niflheim, of the land of the Frost Giants. And the idea is that if the casket is open, it'll basically unleash this infinite cold wherever it's at and wherever it can gain access to. The way in which this happened was by not only Malekith unleashing it on Earth, but when the Bifrost was opened by Surtur, the infinite cold spread through the Bifrost and directly into Asgard itself. And so this led to this massive storming of Asgard where like Heimdall fell and all these things ended up happening. And so following this, what we ended up having was Surtur basically storming Asgard, intending to capture the Eternal Flame due to the fact that he had also been allied alongside Loki, only for us to find out that Loki was a double agent, that he had pretended to be an ally of Surtur, only to turn against him at the last minute when Surtur had gone to capture the Eternal Flame and then discovered it was an illusion created by Loki. And so what this ended up doing is it resulted in Loki, Thor, and Odin coming together and facing off against Surtur, resulting in Surtur's defeat and his imprisonment and something called the Eternal Twilight, I think it is, a dimension whereby anybody who's confined in that location is effectively locked there forever. They'll never be able to come back. And it was essentially Walt Simonson's way of crafting this massive epic and saying, Ragnarok almost happened, but now it's okay. Everything's sorted out. Surtur's been defeated. Loki learned his lesson. Everything's cool. The reason why this matters is because with this story being written in 1986 and 1987, Walt Simonson had actually left the Thor line to launch X Factor. And so following his departure from the Thor title, for the most part, Surtur wasn't really seen that much. He was seen a couple of times when Tom DeFalco was writing the stories, but that was about it. I mean, there really wasn't much with regards to the Surtur character because most writers looked at the run of Walt Simonson and saw it as almost impossible to follow up on. The other half of this was that Marvel was experiencing a lot of waxes and wanes when it came to like the mid 1990s. You had the comic bust, you had a lot of things taking place. And so because of the fact that comic sales were at an all time low, Marvel was facing bankruptcy, what they had to do was actually look at what titles were selling and which titles weren't and find a way to either consolidate or cancel. And so what they did is they launched a story called Heroes Reborn. And this came out of like the Onslaught saga. And the idea was that this being Onslaught, who was basically the combined minds of, or I guess the combined emotional states of Magneto and Charles Xavier brought together, uh, it resulted in like Thor and the Fantastic Four and essentially the characters who weren't selling diving directly into Onslaught in an effort to destroy the entity, which in turn, led to them being recreated and resurrected by Franklin Richards, the son of Reed Richards, in this little blue sphere. But the idea of Heroes Reborn was to essentially sort of soft reboot a lot of the characters that just weren't doing well. Ultimately, all the heroes who were in the Heroes Reborn universe came back during the story Heroes Return, and the Thor title was taken over by a guy named Dan Jurgens. Now, Dan Jurgens started writing Thor from 1998 up until about 2004, 2005, 2006, because what this was designed to do was basically revamp the Thor mythos. Now, a lot of this came came out of the fact that Marvel had escaped bankruptcy by the skin of their teeth, but editor-in-chief Joe Quesada had stepped in and said, we got way too out of hand in like the 1980s and 1990s. We have to consolidate. We have to focus on a core set of titles. And so what they ended up doing was they basically tasked Dan Jurgens with the process of going through and setting the stage for the actual Ragnarok, which is to say the actual destruction of Asgard. And so what this did is it led to a series of stories that culminated in the death of Odin in a battle against Surtur. And so what ended up happening is that with Odin dead and Surtur having defeated him, this launched the actual Ragnarok story. And for the most part, Surtur was just one part of the landscape of Ragnarok. And so the result is that, you know, it led to things like Thor becoming Rune King Thor, basically God going through all the processes of Odin, you know, things along those lines. But it was interesting in and of itself in terms of how all that began to unfold. But ultimately, we ended up learning that Ragnarok was this endless cycle that all the gods were destined to die and be reborn, which is exactly what happened. I mean, following the events of Ragnarok, 
Ragnarok, writer J. Michael Straczynski took over the Thor title, and he began crafting things like the return of the Asgardians, in the sense that Loki was resurrected in the body in a body that was meant for Sif, that Heimdall, for example, was resurrected, and you know, all these different things. They were in their mortal forms, and they had to be quote unquote woken up. But once they were, it was the process of rebuilding Asgard in like Broxton, Oklahoma, different things like that. But for Surtur, questions still lingered among fans in terms of what actually happened to him. Will he ever come back? If the cycle is endless, then that means Surtur can't ever really die because he'll always be reborn alongside everybody else. The same question lingered with regard to Odin. And so what J. Michael Straczynski did in Thor Volume 3, Issues 7 and 8, is he crafted a two-part story that answered the questions about both Odin and Surtur. And essentially what he did is he came along and he said, the two of them, you know, with Odin having died at the hands of Surtur and with Surtur having died when Thor, quote unquote, ended the cycle of Ragnarok is what it did is it took their essences and it threw them into this sort of dark dimension, this alternate reality where they were just locked in an eternal battle forever. They would fight during the day, they would kill each other, they would be reborn the next day, and the cycle would just continue forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, because of the fact that the stories at the time focused on Thor rebuilding Asgard and Straczynski did not want to bring back Odin at the time, what it meant was that Odin was offered the opportunity to finally destroy Surtur and to return back to the mortal plane and take up his his rightful role as ruler of Asgard, but declined. Because if that were the case, there would always be the opportunity for Surtur to come back. But if Surtur and Odin were locked in a eternal battle with each other, then they would just stay there for all time. There would never be a chance for Surtur to actually make his return. And that's how things continued on in Marvel Comics for quite some time. But all of this changed with a story called Fear Itself. Now, for the most part, Fear Itself didn't really have much to do with Surtur proper. Instead, Fear Itself actually focused on someone called the, the Serpent, also known as Kol Borson, who was basically this brother of uh, of Odin that nobody ever knew about. And the whole basis of the story was the idea that Kol Borson was the actual rightful heir to Asgard, but that Odin had effectively usurped the throne and locked his brother away. So it was this introduction of a character that we'd never really seen before. And the story was really cool in and of itself, which we will cover. But the whole idea was that because Kol Borson was basically this almost unstoppable, omnipotent force, what ended up happening is that at the time, Marvel began began focusing on stories involving Loki by himself and the relaunch title Journey into Mystery. And so what Loki ended up doing was basically traveling to this dimension where Surtur and Odin were locked together and then made a bargain and said that he would free Surtur if Surtur was willing to uh, give Loki a piece of the Twilight Blade, which will allow him to basically go through, rewrite the history of Kol Borson, and then in turn allow him to be defeated. And that's exactly what happened. You know, Surtur was effectively freed and went back to his own realm. And so what this did is it allowed Marvel to essentially go forward and have Surtur there in the background, just kind of waiting to be used, that if Marvel chose to bring him back, they would be able to. The issue with this is that the box had already been opened. Ragnarok had already been written. That story had already been done. They really couldn't do Ragnarok again for the most part. They tried when it came to like Loki last days in the collapse of the multiverse. But in terms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I don't think we're actually going to see Surtur as a major force, which is to say the main guy behind it all. We know that basically Hela is the one who seems to be instant the events of Ragnarok, the daughter of Loki, but Surtur seems to be just one of a number of forces who are there, and it may simply just be that he follows in line with the traditional role of Ragnarok, in the sense that once Ragnarok is over, once Hela basically leads to the destruction of Asgard, that Surtur will then emerge. But the fact remains that I think that ultimately it may end up being that like Surtur is basically the one responsible for the death of Odin, that you have Thor and you have the Incredible Hulk who step up, they try to fight Surtur, they both get defeated, Odin steps up, and the two of them fight one another and they both die. And this sets the stage for Thor inheriting the Odin force going forward into Infinity War. That's my prediction in terms of why Surtur's in that movie, you know, why we end up seeing him there. It'll be cool because Surtur's like a thousand feet tall. I mean, he's massive in size. So it'll be cool to see Surtur facing off against Hulk and, you know, well, it'll be cool to see him, uh, see him involved. But again, I don't think he's going to be a main character. I think he'll just kind of be a guy who shows up at the very end once it's all said and done. We'll probably see him fight for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then that'll really be about it. But in any event, guys, hopefully this helps to educate you all on the nature of Surtur himself as a character. Hopefully you're able to go forward into Thor Ragnarok, understanding what he's about, so you won't feel lost when people are talking about him. But with that being said, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like, and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.